is Collins. Is Dolinar. Let's see Ms. Hurst. Ms. Nolter. Nolter. Ms. Peeler. Peeler. Oops. Pekatowski, Lincolnitz, Ms. Hurst. Okie dokie, good to see you all. Finish up with the historical part and move into sources of authority for Christianity. Uh, I mentioned for Protestants, is what you could call conservative Protestants, I guess. Um, this experience of the Enlightenment or the changes that were being brought about by the Enlightenment is called liberalism, yes, yes. And in Catholicism, it was called modernism. But there were responses against, just like in Judaism, the responses to the Haskalah. Um, various types of responses that uh, some accepted the Enlightenment and made changes within Judaism, but others um, rejected it or rejected parts of it. And you see the same kind of response in Christianity. One of, in Protestantism, one of the notable responses is uh, fundamentalism, what's called fundamentalism or the fundamentalist Christian movement. And it takes its, its name from this book called, or actually a series of books, excuse me, a series of books with the title of The Fundamentals, published in 19, started coming out in 1910, but there was a series of, of books, a, a number of volumes that were uh, funded by a, a conservative Christian American oil tycoon. You know, interestingly enough, he had some money and he didn't like what he was seeing that was going on within Protestant Christianity. And so he used his money and got a bunch of Christian scholars together who shared his views to write these books in response. And it started a movement called fundamentalism. So the books were intended to combat the liberalism that was going on and to uh, mis misspelled that word um, and to present the, the fundamentals of Christian belief. What, the writers, the authors, and the underwriter, the, this oil tycoon, thought were the essential beliefs that needed to be upheld within Christianity. I'm not going to give you all the beliefs, but you know some of the beliefs we've talked we've talked about already, or you've heard, like the virgin birth. You know, people since you know miracles, according to the Enlightenment standards, miracles don't happen. Therefore, miraculous births don't happen. And so the, the, you had some Christians, actually a lot of Christians rejecting the virgin birth. And so in the fundamentals, they were reacting against that and saying, no, that's an essential belief, the virgin, that Jesus was born of a virgin in a miraculous way, the virgin birth, the bodily resurrection of Christ. They said that you needed to affirm that. That was an essential part of Christianity because in liberal Protestantism, people tried to um, redefine it as well. Maybe Jesus, Jesus died, but he didn't really um, physically come back to the dead. Maybe it was a spiritual resurrection, or maybe uh, the the apostles and other followers had some sort of mass hallucination where they really thought they saw Jesus, but it wasn't Jesus because, of course, people don't come back from the dead. Again, the Enlightenment ideas rejecting the miraculous. So the fundamentals would say, no, you need to believe in the bodily resurrection. You need to believe in the Bible as the literal word of God. So they were reacting against questioning the, the truths in the Bible or saying the Bible had errors in it uh, or treating the Bible just as any other book as biblical scholars were doing. So these are just some of the ideas that they were defending 
And people agreed with that and said, yeah, 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 I'm on board with that. And so you had the fundamentalist movement start as a response against the Enlightenment. The Catholic Church resisted, simply resisted the Enlightenment um, uh, in modernism. Uh, oh, actually, I wanted to say that. Uh, yeah, so uh, the result of this, of the fun, I should go back to fundamentalism, I want, just saw my notes. Uh, the result of fundamentalism was that the fundamentalists actually motivated or began this movement, which is probably the majority, I don't want to say probably it is actually, the majority of Protestant Christians in the world, groups like Pentecostals or Assemblies of God or just as a general catch-all term, evangelical Christians, born-again Christians, those constitute the, the, the great majority of Protestant Christianity. So it had great, it had great success. And the, the churches, the liberal churches that kind of embraced the Enlightenment, um, these have since that time really gone into decline and fundamentalist groups are pro proliferating. Now get to Catholicism. Modernism. Uh, mo the Catholic Church took its time to finally respond to modernism. Um, the church resisted stoutly modernism or the attempt to bring the Enlightenment ideas into Catholic teaching and into the church and to change the teachings of the church, if need be, according to modern ideas of rationalism, the use of reason and human experience. The Catholic church resisted this consistently throughout the 1800s and the first few decades of the 1900s. But eventually, when we, we come back to our old friend Vatican II in the 1960s, 1962 to 65, there was this council called the Second Vatican Council that I've already mentioned. So I won't go into it anymore, other than to say that Vatican II was kind of the long awaited response by the Catholic Church to the Enlightenment, aka modernism. And Vatican II called for and initiated a general reform of Catholic belief and practice along the lines of the modernist challenge. Um, not, um, well, anyways, um, reaffirming, Vatican II certainly reaffirmed the basic contents of Catholic teaching. It wasn't getting rid of the fundamentals, one might say, of the Catholic Church. So it wasn't saying that, okay, we're now going to revise all our teachings based on the values of the Enlightenment and change them and transform them into something else for the most part, I would say. So basic, basic teachings were reaffirmed, but Vatican, the bishops of Vatican II accepted that there need, you know, they accepted some influence from modern ideas. Like for example, with the Bible, the, the Catholic Church would still teach at Vatican II that the Bible is God's revelation, that it is God's word but uh, would no law, but would also affirm the fact that it is written in the words of men and that the Bible should be, can be, and should be studied like any other book using modern literary methods, stuff like that. Um, but you know, trying to have kind of an approach, not to go from total rejection as in the 1800s and early 1900s to the Catholic Church kind of approaching the modern world in the more positive from a more positive place than it had been. Well, what was the result? Well, the result so far since the 60s has been general chaos <laughs> in the Catholic Church. And I remember there was a book that came out after the council. It wasn't even written by a Catholic. It was written by a Protestant observer at the council, I believe. I want to say it was Robert McAfee Brown, but I could be wrong. But anyways, I just remember the title. The title was, Has the Catholic Church Gone Mad? <laughs> you know, because, because it was like up until the 60s, People may not have liked the Catholic Church in some places, but they certainly respected her. You know, you, at least you knew where you're going to stand with the Catholic Church. And once the 60s came in this kind of attempt, this late attempt to address the Enlightenment, it didn't always go so well. And it wasn't always clear, even within amongst Catholics, what they were supposed to believe. Even on those essential basic beliefs, it wasn't always clear because the idea was change. The change was modernizing or the church was modernizing which for a lot of people meant change. And when change didn't come, then people got angry or disappointed and whatever. And for other people, they thought there was too much change. There were, th there were change in things in the wrong way. So the result has simply been, in the Catholic Church seems to have been chaos. No, no one was sure what to believe anymore. 
you had tens of thousands of priests, monks, and nuns simply leaving their, their, um, their ministry, simply just checking out, just saying, you know, I'm leaving over the, this time period. And many Catholics in the West, there's statistically speaking, many Catholics in the Western countries like Europe and North America no longer practice the faith according to statistics or no longer believe in it at all. I mean, you have Catholic countries, what used to be traditionally Catholic countries or historically Catholic countries like say France, province of Quebec in Canada, now Ireland that just simply, or Czech, the Czech Republic, that simply are, are not religion, not just not practicing, but not even believing, atheist or agnostic. And then you have a lot of Catholics who are leaving for Protestants. And this is, uh, was an issue that started in places like South America. Brazil used to be very solidly almost like 99% Catholic. Now it's maybe 70 some, it's, you know, they're losing left, right and center people to the Protestant communities. Um, because people want that certainty. They want to know what to believe and they, and they want belief, apparently. So that's kind of like been kind of like where things are with the Catholic Church now, at least in its response to modernism or the Enlightenment, I should say. And now I'm going to talk about Christian belief and sources of authority. What is the source of authority? What are the sources of authority for Christianity? Well, the Bring it all into one word, to tie it all into one word, uh, or actually a phrase, I would say. It is the deposit of faith, the deposit of faith. This is a term that is used in Christianity to describe the whole complex, the whole body, the whole group of teachings and practices that are um, either ultimately derived from Jesus of Nazareth or which are based on Christians' understanding of him and how they've lived their lived the Christian message. If uh, uh, have your definition there. If we look at the Catechism of the Catholic Church, number eighty-four, Christian document. And since we're using it for the course, I'll refer to it over there on the board. CCC number eighty-four, the Catechism of the Catholic Church. It, it describes the deposit of faith as a heritage. It's the heritage, the quote unquote heritage of faith. Uh, it describes the deposit of faith as kind of an inheritance, uh, something that Christians inherit from previous Christians. Because I don't know about you, but I wasn't around 2000 years ago when Jesus of Nazareth was alive, nor were when the apostles were alive. So everything I've received about Jesus, my knowledge of Jesus, or how to be like Jesus, I've received from other people who lived before me, and they received it from people who lived before them, et cetera, and so forth, going back 2,000 years to the Jesus movement. So it's an inheritance. I've inherited these things from the past. And it's an inheritance of faith. So it's an inheritance of early Christians' experience of Jesus, their faith in him, but especially the faith of those men called the apostles, the 12 apostles whom Jesus chose. Everything the apostles learned about Jesus, oh, oops, you know, I just launched into my sentence there. The deposit of faith, it, it's a deposit. Think of it like a bank deposit. And that's kind of how the word is being used or had, was used, or the tradition where the word is coming out of, um, because temples in the ancient world in the Greco-Roman world, in the Jerusalem temple, and in, in Judaism, temples were not just places of religious um, activity, but also economic activity. Temples also functioned as banks. People would put their money there. And so, yeah, the, the, your faith, the, the, the church, or, or yeah, the church is kind of like a bank. It's where we place our faith. We deposit your faith there, your faith, and that's where you find your faith in Jesus. And you draw on it, just like you go to an ATM and you draw out some money. People take out from their deposit of faith, their faith in Jesus. Okay, so there, there's a reason for that word there. And it has a, a connection to um, ancient culture. But what is the deposit of faith is, it's just a, it's a phrase to describe this concept that everything that the apostles learned about Jesus from having lived with him, listened to him speak and teach, of course, 
experiencing um, his suffering and his death, watching it or, or knowing about his suffering and death and his resurrection. Um, this has been passed on by the apostles in their preaching and in their manner of life. And so Christianity is drawing its beliefs from that ultimate source, that it, Jesus and his teaching and his life are the deposit, the bank from which I am taking out my money of, i.e. faith, my act of faith, or my knowledge of what to believe and what to, how, what to, how to act. Um, yeah, I think so. This, uh, I do, yeah, I'm looking at my picture there. This one deposit comes to, in Christianity, is conceived in two ways. And this is nothing unique to Christianity. You see this in just about every religion. Every religion has a sort of oral talking about something that's passed on from person to person. And they also seem to have inspired writings or authoritative writings, okay? So Christianity is no different. The one experience of Jesus, the founder of Christianity, or of the Jesus movement, I should say, it has two aspects to it, a written aspect and an oral aspect. The written aspect is called sacred scripture, sacred scripture, and the oral or spoken aspect is called sacred tradition. Remember, Christianity comes out of Judaism. Judaism in general, of course, the, the Jewish religion, even though Christianity is, uh, as I've said before, is more of a, well, related to modern Judaism, their sister religions, but comes out of Judaism in general. And remember that in Judaism, you have, a, again, this concept of a written Torah, a written Torah and an oral Torah. A, a Torah that was written down by God himself, like on the Ten Commandments, but also uh, an oral spoken Torah that was passed on by, you know, Jewish leaders and rabbis later on. The same idea in Christianity it makes sense because Jesus was a Jew and the apostles were Jewish. So the same concepts are there. Okay. So we'll talk about first about uh, sacred scripture, which when we come to Christianity, that's the thing that most people are familiar with, the Bible, okay? Just the Bible, okay? And interestingly enough, like if you ask people about Christianity or it's funny because, or, or what's the basis of their faith? A lot of times people won't even, at least in my experience, they don't go to Jesus. They don't say Jesus. They don't hold up a picture of Jesus or the cross or even the Cairo or something. Yeah. You know, a lot of times people say, well, this, the Bible, you know, and that's what you see in preachers' hands all the time. You don't see pictures of Jesus. Was like, this, the Bible, the word of God, this is where you find Jesus. Well, Jesus wasn't a book last time I checked. You know, Jesus was a man, you know, flesh and blood. Um, and it's, it's just fine. I find it interesting that that, this, a book is actually the thing that is what, and most are, is what pops into most people's minds when they think about Christianity don't think about Jesus so much. Jesus is like a character in the book rather than Jesus and the book comes later and is related to him. But anyways, I'll start with sacred scripture. Sacred scripture, again, it's a technical term for the writings, the authoritative writings of Christianity, but the word simply means holy writings, scripture, scripture. Um, comes from Latin scriptura, which means a writing, something that is written, okay? Um, escribir, if you speak Spanish, escritura, yeah? it's, it's Latin, okay? It's something that is written, so the holy writings. And this term scripture can be used in, and sometimes used in religious studies specifically to describe authoritative writings in any religion. So the Vedas in Hinduism could be described as scriptures as well you know that sometimes religious studies scholars will use it in a technical sense of any kind of sacred writing or authoritative writing in a religion okay but for christians sacred scripture is the bible and there's your definition of the bible it is the name for the entire group of writings accepted by christians the word bible in greek simply means the book 
That's what it literally translates to, to biblion. The word Bible comes from to, the, and biblion, book. So the book. And this name, the Bible, is used to describe the complete collection of all the, of Christianity's sacred writings. I guess I want to say, yeah, I do want to say that. The list of books that are found in this Bible, in this book, the list of books that are contained here actually um, are written over you know, a long, long, long period of time. I talked about this at least with the Jewish sacred writings before, and I'll talk about the Christian writings in a moment, but all the books that are in there, interestingly enough, were not officially established, at least in the West, in the Roman Catholic Church until the 15th century. They were just accepted. I mean, it's not like they made them up in the 15th century. It's like these books were there. They were in the Catholic Bible, but it wasn't until the Council of Florence in the 15th century that there was actually an official statement in the West. And in the West, it's the Roman Church. As you should know from our history by now, of Christianity, that uh, the fourth of this Council of Florence, which was held in the 1400s, the 15th century, that the Roman church actually came out with an official statement listing the books, okay, this is it. Why? Well, for a very good reason, there was controversy. There were people who were starting to question, you know, should these books really still be in here? Should they, should they not be, you know, stuff like that. And this especially gets going with the Protestant Reformation, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. But just so you, just to give you some background, that the Bible as we have it now was around. We, we know we have manuscripts from before the 15th century, so we know the books that were there. So there was nothing new were being added. It's just that the official authority, the official list of the authoritative writings did not receive its stamp of approval until Florence, the Council of Florence in the 15th century. That's in Western Christianity. In Eastern Christianity, as far as I know, as far as I can tell, um, there's never been any official statement establishing the authoritative writings. So the, just accepted. They're part of what's been handed on, sacred tradition, which we'll talk about in a moment. But they're just what's been received from the past, and apparently there's no reason to question it. Um, also because the East, Easterners can't hold a council. <laughs> but anyways, so there's no real official statement from Eastern Orthodoxy, uh, but there is the traditional listing. What about the Protestant Christians from the West? I'll talk about them in a few moments and what issue there is there. The authors of the books in the Bible are generally unknown for the most part. Usually they don't identify who the author is. And uh, it's a library, as we, we saw, I think, with the Tanakh. You know, there are all sorts of different genres of literature in the Bible, not just in the Jewish portion, but also coming later in the Christian portion. It's a library of books. It's a grab bag of books. It's not, uh, it's not just one single story being told from beginning to end. It's a collection, okay? Um, the, the, book, the books of the Bible are generally considered to have been inspired by God, to have come from God, not necessarily directly. It's not like the Shruti. Remember, the Shruti in Hinduism are believed like to be a direct, like a direct access to Brahman, to the truth of the universe. Okay, there's like, they, the belief is that the writers of the Vedas had some sort of direct intuition about the truth of the universe and, and um, well, they wrote them down later, but they didn't write them down. Remember, they spoke them. They would sing them. There were hymns meant to be sung. You didn't write them down, okay? You just passed them on orally right there. Um, and the same, there's a, the same kind of idea, of, but in this case, we have a God who's kind of motivating spiritually or supernaturally motivating people to write down certain writings. And that's what inspiration means, inspired in the Christian idea it's not like hearing the sound of the universe in Hinduism, you know, like bing, you know, you know, there's an immediate awakening or opening of your mind to the universe, universal truth. No, this is a God spiritually has motivated a man or a woman to write something down. So that's what they believe about the books of the Bible. The Bible is separated into two sections, the Old Testament and the New Testament. There are two sections to the, the, to the Bible, the Old Section, excuse me, the, the Old Testament and the New Testament. 
And one of them is Jewish and one of them is Christian, although of course the original Christians were Jews. So that's kind of a misnomer, I guess. Um, or maybe it's a, a, a redundancy to say, say that, but, but just for, to be kind of clear, I'm, I'm simplifying, but to be clear, the Old Testament is essentially, the Old Testament part of the Christian Bible is essentially a version of the Jewish scriptures, the Jewish Tanakh. And the New Testament are the Christian writings that come later and are added on to this version of the Jewish Tanakh. So the Old Testament is the name Christians give to the Jewish scriptures, the originally Jewish scriptures that are found in their Bible. Jews do not call the Tanakh that, as I told you. They don't call it the Old Testament because it's still valid for them. It's still, you know, it's still God's word for them. It hasn't been fulfilled or superseded by anything. But once you have Christian writings, they get added on and they're called new because they come later. And so that the New Testament is the name for the Christian writings. Why Testament? The word for these two sections. Testament refers to that idea of covenant that I talked about with Judaism. Testamentum in Latin means covenant, an agreement, a contract between two people, or in the case of the Jews, a contract between God and them, the descendants of Jacob Israel. Why is the Jewish one called old and the Christian new? Because the old has been fulfilled in the new. It's not like it's passe or worthless, but the old has been fulfilled in the new. So, I mean, the, the old covenant or the uh, Jewish right or, or the, the beginning of the Bible, they make up the whole first part of the, of the Bible. Okay. And in fact, the majority of the Bible, I mean, this whole section is the, the version of the Jewish, the Christian version of the Tanakh. And then the new Testament is actually quite small in comparison. Okay. So the whole first part, are the Jewish scriptures, and they're old, and not in the sense that they're worthless, because they're there, they're not worthless, obviously, Christians kept them as part of their sacred writings, but they are seen to be fulfilled in Jesus of Nazareth, okay, which is new, a new development, one might say. So when we look, now when we look at the two, when we look at the two sections of the Bible, the Old Testament and the New Testament, um, you might notice that, interestingly, there are more writings or there are, there are more writings than Jews today would accept. If you could compare the Tanakh in the Bible, the Tanakh that's contained in the Bible with the Tanakh that Jews accept now and have accepted for eh, a long time, but I don't want to put a, put a number on it because I'm not, I know it's more than a thousand years. Well, I'd say no, I can't put a number on it let's say about for 1700 years, um, the, 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 the official version that the Jews accept now actually comes later in history than the, the version that is in the Christian Bible. What do I mean by that? Why are there more writings in the Christian Tanakh? Why is it longer with more books and stuff than what Jews accept now? Well, it's because what was going on in first century Judaism. You remember, you know, modern Judaism and Christianity both emerge from gen Judaism in general. And in first century Judaism, we know, because we, we have the documents, the manuscripts, we know that there were a lot more writings that were being used by Jews and considered as sacred, considered as inspired writings than what eventually the Jews themselves would accept. So there were more writings accepted as sacred by first century Jews than would later be accepted into what you might call the official Tanakh, that rabbis would later say, okay, this is what we accept. And so the Christian Old Testament, because they were Jews and you know they had all these other writings that were people accepted and didn't question apparently, um, and no judgment had been made as had been made later, the Christian Old Testament is longer by several books than what would later become the Jewish set of writings. Because remember what I told you about Judaism. At the time of Jesus, for example, um, you know, the Torah was set, the Torah everyone agreed on. And this was even centuries before Jesus. You know, the Torah, the five books of the Torah 
were pretty clear and accepted. The prophets, nah, not as much. Okay, there was, you know, some prophets were clear, but you know, there's still books of the prophets that it wasn't sure, it wasn't clear if they were scripture or not. And then definitely the writings, the Ketuvim, remember there that was a whole grab, that's a whole grab bag, a whole group of literature, different genres of literature, not all of which um, the rabbis could agree on. And it took time. And I talked about the Council of Jamnia in that period after the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, um, when the, the, the Jewish leadership had to come to, to come together and regroup. And uh, because the temple had been destroyed, a lot of Palestine had been destroyed by the Roman army. Um, and, uh, you know, it was a question mark whether Judaism would even survive as a religion. But because of the Council of Jamnia, they were able to regroup and bring it back together. Part of, at least according to the story, I mean, we don't have any records of this, but according to the story, that was around the period of time, in the late first century, the early 100s, when the Jewish community started to begin a discussion of, okay, we know we got the Torah, what's next? You know, what else do we accept? And, uh, but Christianity goes a different route. It's Jewish as well, and it brings with it all those other writings that around the time of Jesus and the apostles that they apparently accepted. Writings like what? I'm not going to give you all the writings. There are several of them, but just to give you some examples, you know, there are extra books in the Christian Bible, like Tobit, Tobit that the Jews don't have. Uh, they had them, but they did, later didn't accept them. There are books called the first and second books of Maccabees that are in the Christian Bible that the Jews also later did not accept. And there are reasons for that that I'm not going to get into, but just, you know, when we're talking about the Christian Bible and why the Old Testament is different from Judaism, you know, that this is what's going on. Um, so those would be two examples. There are other books, but I'm not going to get into them. Those are examples of whole books that are that Jews later did not accept and did not receive into their Tanakh. Uh, there is a, there are books like the Book of Esther, which Jews and Christians both have in their Old Testaments, Tanakh or Old Testament, uh, you know, depending on which Jews you belong to. However, they're different. They're different. So, like in the Book of Esther, the uh, the Jewish version is much shorter. The Christian version is longer. And there was a lot of debate amongst the rabbis about whether Esther should even be in the Tanakh, because uh, I believe uh, Esther is placed amongst the Ketuvim, the writings. But there were some rabbis that did not want Esther to be in. Why? Because it's a weird book. It's, it's the story of a Jewish woman that never mentions God in the whole story. Never uses the word God, never mentions God at all. And so some of the rabbis are like, how can, you, how can you accept this book into the Tanakh as the word of God? And it never mentions God. You know, God is not part of the story in the book of Esther, in the Hebrew version, in the Jewish version. But apparently some, there, there was another version of the story that was much longer and did add all sorts of references to God. Maybe someone was embarrassed by it. and like, ah, we got to clean this up. Anyways, all sorts of additions. You know, Esther offers prayers now to God and God is mentioned. And that becomes the Christian, the accepted Christian version, which was also a Jewish version. But the Jews eventually said, no, we'll take the shorter version. That's the Old Testament. The Protestants, I said I mentioned the Protestants. This, this Old Testament that I've been describing to you, this version of the Tanakh, which comes from the earliest days of Christianity, um, is not accepted by the Protestants later on. Remember, the Protestant reformers come in the 1500s. Okay, And, and one of the things that happens is Luther um, and other reformers with him question the, the authoritative writings that are in the Bible, especially in, in the Old Testament. Um, Luther assumed, and people who supported him, wrongly we know, he didn't know, he thought he was right, assumed that the Jews were right. He thought, well, the Jews would know what their scriptures are, you know, forgetting, of course, the fact that the apostles and Jesus were Jews. <laughs> and the situation was quite different in first century Judaism. No, he just assumed that, well, the Jews would know. They would know which books were theirs and should belong. 
and there they decided which books should be in there. So we should really follow the Jewish list, according uh, Jewish list of authoritative writings. He thought they had the more accurate grouping of books. And then, of course, he thought that the Roman church, which he was opposing at the time, had added those books that I mentioned to you, these several books, actually added them in later at some period of time to the Tanakh. He was wrong. I mean, we have manuscripts. We have manuscripts even from before the time of Jesus of some of these books, like Tobit. You know, we, we know they existed before Jesus. Um, so he was wrong. He didn't know any of this. He just made this assumption that it was based on some faulty assumptions that, well, the Jews would know and boo on the Catholics. <laughs> the Catholics, the Pope was the Antichrist. So, you know, if the Pope says that those books should be there, then I'm going to say, no, they shouldn't be there. You know, this kind of opposite, this kind of mentality. So, um, so he actually and other reformers just removed them. They, they looked at, you know, the list that the Jews accepted. They said, well, is that book there? The Jews accept that? Nope. Take it out. Gone. Is that there? Nope. Oh, do they accept? They have this version of the book of Esther or this version of the book of Daniel. Is that different from all from the Catholic one? Yes. Okay. Get rid of the Catholic one. Yeah. So they removed the books that were not found in the contemporary Tanakh of the 1500s ignoring the fact that there have been 15 centuries before them that might have been a little different. So Protestant Christians will have a smaller Old Testament than Catholics or Eastern Orthodox, the ancient Christian churches, which will, uh, will have a longer version, okay? And if you're a Protestant, of course, you know, the argument is, well, there, you have extra books. You know, the Catholics and the Orthodox have that extra books, all right? Um, so we have the Old Testament. We have the Jewish Tanakh accepted because Christianity comes from Judaism. So that seemed like a no-brainer. But eventually, within Christianity, in spite writings that are considered to be also from God appear, we have specifically Christian writings appear, and that collection is called the New Testament, which I mentioned already. Okay. These are added on to, notice they don't supersede or they don't like supplement the Old Testament. The Old Testament, the Jewish Tanakh is not taken away. It doesn't disappear, it's still there, but these are added to the, uh, the Jewish Tanakh. And the Tanakh is seen, is reread in the light of Jesus of Nazareth, who Christians believe, has, believe have, has fulfilled the, the revelation of God to Israel that is contained here continues on and is fulfilled in God's revelation to Israel and Jesus, the Messiah, his God's son. So now we have a New Testament. I gave you the dates about the Old Testament kind of before when I did Judaism. Well, I did, but um, the dates for the New Testament for the Christian writings. Uh, when were they written? As far as you can tell, sometime from the, the 40s AD until the early 100s AD is when the Christian writings, inspired writings, I should say, there were other Christian writings that were not inspired, but the New Testament writings were, were composed, we believe, the 40s until the 100s. Seems like a good ballpark figure, pretty accurate. And what do we have here? In the New Testament, we can divide it into four types of literature in the New Testament. Gospels, history, oh, I say history, I should reverse that. Gospels, letters, history, and then apocalyptic. I have gospels and letters because there's actually, I'd say gospels and, well, I wouldn't say, I would say that gospels and letters are the two most important, certainly more numerous, than history and apocalyptic, of which we only have one book for each. So these are the four kinds of documents. The first kind we have is called a gospel. You have your definition there. It is a peculiarly Christian genre of literature. There were no such things as gospels before Christianity. So it's an invention of Christians. And the word gospel comes from Greek kind of, it's kind of a translation of the Greek into old English. But anyways, the word gospel comes from Greek and means a good message, euangelos. The two words, you, which, you, which means good, 
like euphony, something is euphonious. He means it, it's like you say mu music is euphonious. It means it sounds good. Okay. If you have, uh, oh, anyways, euphoria is meaning good feelings. Okay. So you, Angelos, the word angel really means a messenger or a message. So you, Angelos means, uh, or actually it's evangelion in, in Greek, but you, Angelos, these two words come together. And so gospel means a good message or as is most commonly translated, good news. I have news for you and it's good. What is a gospel? Generally, it tells the story of Jesus's ministry, and that's it. The focus of the gospels are the ministry of Jesus, okay? The time when he, he was teaching and doing his work. Um, they're not biographies. I mean, they kind of look like biographies in some ways, but really, once you start reading them, maybe if you've read the gospel of Mark already or whatever, or looked at it, they're not biographies in that kind of way, because there's no real focus on the birth of Jesus, his childhood, his adulthood, all that stuff. No, the gospels pretty much jump into the beginning of Jesus's ministry right there when he's around 30. OK, yes, there are some stories about the birth of Jesus. But again, that's not the main focus of the gospels. They're not really biographies. They're not meant to be histories of Jesus. They're the story of Jesus, though, but what may more like the meaning of Jesus. Okay, they want to tell why does Jesus matter? What was his purpose? And so they focus on his ministry. And especially they focus on his suffering and death. In fact, if you look at the Gospels, you know, a large portion, maybe a third of each Gospel, um, is taken up with just the just recounting the trial of Jesus, how he was arrested, how he suffered, and then how he was crucified and died. So there's a large focus of the gospel story is on his suffering and death, as as the part of, as the, that part of his ministry is emphasized. Even the resurrection, even the raising from the dead, people might think, oh, wait, hey, that's the victory march, you know. So they'd be focused on that. Well, not really. I mean, the resurrection is mentioned if you look at the gospels. But it's not really, it's not, again, it's not, uh, it's not as focused on as the suffering and the death it certainly is there. Um, so that's what's going on in the Gospels, apparently. The uh, Gospels, in regards to the, the New Testament, the Gospels come first in the New Testament. They are the most important documents of the New Testament, but they were not the first to be written, we believe. Um, they were not the first documents of the New Testament writings uh, to have been written. They're not the earliest documents um, out of the New Testament. But because they are about Jesus Christ specifically, they comprise the main focus of the New Testament. So they come first, which would make sense. We don't know exactly who wrote these Gospels. Tradi the traditional names or attributions are here. Matthew, Mark. Luke and John, these four male names, but are they the authors? They don't say they are. You know, each gospel is simply identified as the gospel, the good news of Matthew, or the good news of Mark. And that's it. It's just a title that someone put on later. And these people aren't necessarily even mentioned in the gospel. So it's not clear what the connection is between these four people. But these are the traditional people, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Traditionally, from some things that we know, that you know, people think that Matthew and John, because Jesus did have two apostles named Matthew and John. And so traditionally, Christians have believed that Matthew and John are one part of the 12 apostles. So maybe the gospels with their names are the way they're preaching about Jesus that got written down or something like that, or maybe they were the actual authors of the gospel, who knows, but Matthew and John were apparently 12 apostles of Jesus. We have two that were named Matthew and John. Mark and Luke definitely know, you know, there, there is no Mark and there is no Luke in the lists of apostles of Jesus. So we know they were part of the 12 apostles apparently, um, but they are mentioned in other places. So we have an idea of who they are. They were, later followers they were christians who were later followers of, 
of the Christian movement, the Jesus movement. Um, it's not clear that they are actually followers of Jesus himself. I said not clear, they could have been, but it doesn't seem to be. It seems to have been people who came to believe in Jesus, especially Luke. Luke, I don't think, was even a Jew. I think he was just, he was a Greek. But anyway, actually, no, let me think about that. Was he, uh, I think I know, maybe his mother was Jew. Yes, so maybe, oh, he's a Hellenistic Jew, a Greek Jew. Okay, forget what I said about that. Um, nevertheless, Mark and Luke don't have really much of a connection to Jesus, but they do traditionally have connections to the apostles. This man, Peter, was one of the apostles of Jesus, chosen by Jesus. In fact, the head of the 12 apostles, chosen by Jesus. And Mark was said to be his companion. Apparently, he was a companion of Peter, the apostle. And Luke was a companion of Paul, the apostle, who later became a follower of Jesus and became an apostle in a leadership position in the church, one of the apostles. Later on, he's made an apostle. And so Luke is connected with him. So there you go. I mean, those, those connections are there, but how, how much more does that, how much farther does that bring us in knowing the relation, their relationships to each gospel? It's not, not totally clear, but anyways. So the gospels. There are four of them, but I just want to make this one, this point. Although there are four gospels, Christianity really sees them as a unity. They are real. Jesus is the one gospel. The good news is about Jesus. There's one Jesus. And the four gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are seen as the, a portrayal of Jesus according to four traditions. Okay, these four traditions. These are four. It's the same Jesus. When you read the four gospels, you're clearly deal, dealing with the same person. It's not like Jesus is a schizo or something. Like, you know, one gospel, he's this, and another gospel, he's that. And, no, I mean, it's clearly the same person that's being described, but whoever wrote each one has a different portrait of Jesus, has something that has a way of, has a, a certain understanding of Jesus that he wants to emphasize or put forward. So it's the one good, one gospel, really, in Christianity, but there are four traditions, four ways, four iterations, you might say, of Jesus and how he's presented. The next genre is, are the letters. And a letter, I think, is self-explanatory, so I don't need to explain what a letter is, okay? Um, that's how you kept in touch with people, you know, in the ancient world. There was no Twitter or telephone, so you had to write letters to people. And uh, there are many letters in the New Testament. Most of them come from our friend Paul of Tarsus. Again, you can see his influence on the, influence on the Jesus movement and how it develops. I mean, when people... Not only are his writings considered inspired by God and scriptural, but you know most of his writings are collected, that people kept them. So most of the letters in the New Testament come from Paul. And uh, there are a few other letters written by different people. Some of them claim to have been apostles of Jesus, the 12 apostles. Some of them may have been relatives of Jesus. Okay, fine. Um, but uh, they're there. So we have letters and writing about, and, and these letters are generally writing about issues in the Christian community that uh, Paul, and to take Paul as an example, he's writing to various Christian communities that he's visited or that he's himself has set up. And there are oftentimes problems. And so he has to address problems or answer questions that people might have, stuff like that. The next uh, version or the next genre we have is a history, a history. There is only one history in the New Testament, and that is the Acts of the Apostles. The Acts of the Apostles was written by Luke, and Luke apparently wrote one book, actually. The first part, part one, is his gospel, is the ministry of Jesus, and then he attached a part two where he kind of gives his his version of the early years of Christ, the Christian church as it spread out amongst Jews and then eventually amongst Gentiles. It's not meant to give a complete history. It's Luke's, Luke's idea of what the church should look like and what was going on, what he saw as was going on in, in Christianity as it started to, um, to move out after the time of Jesus. And that was part two. Um, because it wasn't a gospel, it got cut off and separated from the gospel. So Luke's first part is in the gospels and then 
right after the Gospel of John and then the New Testament you'll have Acts of the Apostles, which is really the Gospel of Luke part two, but it's called the Acts of the Apostles. And then we have the final genre, one book, which is called apocalyptic literature, apocalyptic. That book is the Revelation of John, also known as the Book of Revelation. You know, if you, I like horror movies, maybe I shouldn't, but I do. And, you know, I always love like the end of the world horror movies, you know, the spooky supernatural ones. And, and yes, the Book of Revelation is, uh, has, has, has generated many the horror movies because it's, it's interesting. It's full of all sorts of weird stuff, you know, and the people can play off of, and it's all the devil and 666 and stuff like that. That's where you find 666 in the book of Revelation. Apocalypse, apocalypse in, in Greek, it comes from this Greek word apocalypse, actually apocalypsis, but the word apocalypse comes from Greek and simply means revelation. So no big secret. The revelation of John, the apocalypse of John, the revelation that this man, John, has. And uh, sometimes, for whatever reason, you'll see it. Well, actually, more often than not, you'll see it called the Book of Revelation. But officially, its title is the Revelation of John in Greek. Um, and what is it? What is apocalyptic literature? Apocalyptic literature is a kind of symbolic literature. Okay, it uh, has to, it focuses on visions of the spiritual realm, like heaven or the realm of the angels. Um, it focuses on like the afterlife, stuff like that. It also has, it also sometimes has this focus on the end of the world. And uh, if you read some of this literature, because you have Jewish apocalyptic literature, Christian apocalyptic literature, um, and other groups had their own apocalypses, their own apocalyptic literature. And you know, one thing that unites them is the use of this you know, weird symbolic images, visions of some kind of supernatural realm. And they're trying to like predict, they're talking about their own time, but somehow sometimes they're kind of like, the person's receiving visions of the future. And then people like to try and, and look at the symbols and try and figure out, well, what is this symbol of, of the future, you know? like. And that was a big thing. That's a big thing for some Christians, mainly more so, I think, like in the 80s and 90s when I've been growing up or was growing up. Not so you don't hear so much about it now, but um, the preachers on television, you know, I used to get these little pamphlets from one preacher and stuff like that. Um, what was it? The Worldwide Church of God or something. And they're all about the book of Revelation, you know, and trying to, inter you know, try to interpret all the symbols that were in the apocalypse of John, you know. Does this refer to Ronald Reagan? You know, Ronald Wilson Reagan, you know, 666, six letters in Ronald, six letters in Wilson, six letters in Reagan. So was President Ronald Reagan the beast? Was he the Antichrist? Maybe. Or maybe some of the visions and the symbols described in the Revelation of John referred to the Soviet Union, the communists. Who knows? You know, it, it shifts people trans because they're symbols that can be read various ways. And so people are looking like to see if they're predictions of the future and the end of the world. And that's kind of what makes apocalyptic kind of fun. And if you're a movie maker, it makes it really fun if you want to make a spooky little horror film. But it also makes it hard to interpret. So we have a version of apocalypse, Christian apocalyptic in the New Testament. I mentioned, for example, you have the famous symbol that just probably everyone has heard of, of the number of the beast, which is 666, um, which a lot of people interpret as the devil, which they're, they're wrong. <laughs> it can't be the devil. Uh, I mean, it's so obviously not the devil. Why? Well, because if you actually read the book of Revelation and the passage where it mentions it, it says right there, it is the number of a man. And last time I checked, the devil is not a man. The devil is a fallen angel, a spiritual creature. He's not a human or a man. So it obviously cannot refer to Satan or the devil. Um, you have to understand, like the ancient world, uh, people in al alphabets like Greek and Hebrew and stuff like that, 
um, you use the alphabet for numbers. They didn't have Arabic numerals. So people used the alphabet for numbers. Think of Roman numerals. It's all I's and V's, the letter I, the letter V, the letter X, your letters, and they have a numerical value. So, you know, in Greek, the letters have a numerical value. And if you go into the Greek and you read the book in Greek in its original language and you add it up, yeah, it probably refers to the Emperor Nero. Um, the Emperor Nero, who lived in the 60s, reigned in the 60s. And why would the, uh, the Christian author think that Nero was the beast, this evil creature? Because Nero is the one who killed the apostles Peter and Paul. It was under Nero that they were executed in Rome. So he was an apostle killer. He was an enemy of the church. So a lot of the visions and things that are going on in the revelation of John in the, in the New Testament uh, probably are referring at that time to the Roman Empire and its persecution of the church. Whether it has future implications, I don't know. That's, that's God's business, not mine. But apoco just apocalyptic is the, the last genre that we find in the New Testament. Okay. Uh, okay, moving on to the next piece of the puzzle. We go from sacred scripture to sacred tradition. The other part. It's not all about the Bible. It's about the message about Jesus, which was handed on. And in fact, you could argue that, and I would argue this actually, that for Christianity, sacred tradition comes first because the, the New Testament has to develop and come from somewhere. What is it, where does it come from? It comes from the oral preaching of the message about Jesus. And that's pretty much what sacred tradition is. It's sacred and it's sacred stuff that's handed on. Trado in Latin simply means to hand down, pass along, hand on, all it means. So holy things that have been handed on. You have to be careful with it in a religion because it's being used here in a technical religious sense for this religion. Okay. And so it's not necessarily being, well, it's not really being used in the, the common sense that people talk about traditions and customs. Okay. You know, it's a tradition in my family that we eat turkey on Thanksgiving. All right, fine. That, that's a tradition, but it's still Thanksgiving if you eat hamburgers or if you eat vegetable burgers, if you're, you don't want to eat meat or something. You know, it's, it's still, you're still celebrating, are you still celebrating Thanksgiving? Is it Thanksgiving Day? Yes, yes. So who cares what kind of food you eat? Okay, these are traditional foods, pumpkin pie, turkey, you know, peculiarly, peculiarly. American foods, they come from America. They don't come from anywhere else. So we eat them, but you could eat something else. That's not how tradition is being used here. It might include customs that people, Christians might do. Like at one time, Catholics were not supposed to eat meat on Friday, then they, or they were, they were supposed to not eat meat on Friday and now they can, it used to be a church law. Actually, no, the law was never, real, the law was never, not really changed, actually. Catholics are still supposed to do penance on Fridays, which includes not eating meat. It's just not an actual law anymore. It was made voluntary. And I'm sure they quickly found out that when you say that something doesn't have to be done anymore as a law, <laughs> just do it because you want to do it. You find out how much people really want to do it and so forth. <laughs> We don't have to eat meat on Friday. We don't have to avoid meat on Fridays. We have to eat fish on Fridays. We can eat a hamburger on Fridays. No, you're still supposed to do penance, which could include not eating meat, but could include something else. So traditions and customs change. You know, the mass, you know, went to a Catholic church 50, 60 years ago. It would all be in Latin. Now it's not, you know, it's just, those are customs, but that's not, those are traditions in the sense of customs or habits but that's not sacred tradition. Sacred tradition is what? It is the lived experience of the church's preaching about Christ, what she believes about Christ. And so according to the Catechism of the Catholic Church, if you wanna look at paragraph 76, there's a nice little definition there about sacred tradition. What is sacred, tra what is sacred tradition? It comprises the oral preaching of the apostles about Christ, as well as their example as how to live Christ's teachings Sacred tradition also includes any institutions they may have established in the community, okay? It's basically the development, the logical and experiential development of Jesus and what he taught and who he was. 
Why? Because Jesus didn't teach about the atom bomb. Jesus didn't tell me anything about nuclear weapons. Or Jesus didn't tell, say anything about polygamy or, or, or abortion or any of the, the modern or not modern concerns. Um, Jesus didn't say a, a lot about, any, well, anything about those things. Why? Because he didn't know them. He didn't know about them. They weren't issues. So Jesus didn't have any idea of Islam or have any comment about, well, what do you think about the prophet Muhammad, Jesus? You know, Muhammad wasn't alive then, okay. or communism or anything like that. Um, so you have the experience of Jesus that the church has, the experience of who he was and what he taught and what he was for, and that develops, that sacred tradition. It's the development of that experience. It happens very quickly in Christianity. I talked about in the historical section about the Council of Jerusalem. Within, you know, a few years of Jesus not being around anymore, you have the whole question of circumcision. You know, Jesus practiced it. Jesus was a faithful Jew. But now you have this other, Paul of Tarsus saying, no, it's not necessary. Well, Jesus never addresses circumcision. He never mentions circumcision at all, apparently. At least not in the Gospels. So what to do, <laughs> you know? Well, the apostles base their, their uh, decision on what do they know about Jesus? And they draw, on the they draw on the implications of who Jesus was and why he came. Um, what was the purpose of his ministry? It was a purpose of what healing and salvation. And so they kind of draw out their own logical, the logical implications of Jesus's message and who he was. But also the apostles have to, there's this belief that Jesus and God somehow give some sort of inspiration and guidance, some spiritual guidance to lead the church, to accurately develop Jesus's teaching. So it's not like something that Jesus completely would have disagreed with, okay? At least that's the understanding of sacred tradition for Christians. Whether that's actually the case, well, let people debate. Some people, like the Protestant reformers, that was one of their arguments that you know, the church had actually veered off in its tradition from what Jesus wanted. So you have that disagreement amongst Christians. But ideally, no, it should be the church is, mo is moved by God in the correct direction of what Jesus would want. Okay. Sacred tradition is not, it is written down. It's not written down in the sense that, like, it's not like the Bible written down, but Sacred tradition includes, as I said, the church's preaching, the experience, the Christian lived experience. And so, yes, you have writings of people, for example, called the church, what are traditionally called uh, the church of fathers of the church or church fathers. The, over the first 700 years, say from the first 700 years of Christianity, you have this group of people called the church fathers who are spiritual leaders in the church who um, Tons of them. They're all sorts of different ones, you know. Um, it's 700 years, so there are a lot of them. And they write, they're writing about Christianity and they're writing about the faith of the church. And so they have an authoritative status. So you could go to their writings, you could go to the library and look up their writings, their stuff like that. There um, might be compilations of their teachings. The bishops, the you have Jesus, of course. Jesus is the founder. But Jesus is not going to be around all the time, so he chooses 12 apostles to continue his mission, which they do, but they're also not going to be around, so they choose other men to continue the mission they've received. And these men are called bishops, which I'll talk about later, but these men have the name of bishop. So you have the bishops who are also continuing, their, their job is to be teachers in the Christian religion um, and to continue the teachings of Jesus and to accurately define the, the Christian, Christian experience of, of who Jesus is and what he would want Christians to believe and to practice. I would say that the most obvious exercise or the most representative example of sacred tradition would be the ecumenical councils, these things, the seven ecumenical councils. Why seven ecumenical councils? Because these are the councils that are accepted by Catholic, Roman Catholics, Eastern Orthodox, and for the most part, Protestants, okay? There are some Protestants who would not accept these councils or any councils at all, for that matter. 
But for the most part, the Church of England, the Lutherans would, would accept these councils. And I think a lot of other groups like Presbyterians, the Cal Calvinist inspired communities like the Presbyterians, groups like the Baptists, some Baptists might not, but some would. Um, the seven ecumenical councils. I'm giving these as an example of sacred tradition because, um, well, I just am, because <laughs> I think they are a good, they're obvious, an obvious exercise of how it kind of works, you know, tradition and practice. You know what a council is because I discussed it when I talked about Vatican II. It's a meeting of bishops. You also know what ecumenical means because I talked about it when I talked about Vatican II. It means universal. So these seven councils that are accepted amongst the Catholics, the Orthodox, and to some extent Protestants, um, what was I going to say? Uh, hmm, I just lost my train of thought. And, da, 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 da. Well, start talking and then maybe your train of thought will come back. These councils are meetings of the bishops who address questions that come up in, in the faith of how to live the message of Jesus. You know, problems develop periodically. Um, in Christianity, and the authorities feel like they need to meet together to decide what the response is, how to apply their experience of Jesus, or at least apply the tradition that what's been handed on to them about Jesus, how does that apply to the modern circumstance, okay? And so you have these seven councils that are accepted. Uh, Still don't know what I want. I know I wanted to say something important. I thought it was important, but I guess not. Um, no, it doesn't matter. The first council, Nicaea. Well, you see from the, the PowerPoint, some councils I'm considering more important than others. And so I put the ones in bigger letters and black. And then there's some others that are, you know, less of lesser importance in my opinion. And so I didn't embolden them. Um, but starting with Nicaea in 325 AD. All of these, uh, you have a question about who Jesus is, and almost all of these councils, to one extent or another, or another, are dealing with that question during these first 700 years of the, the these councils. Who is Jesus? What is Jesus? Okay, just the basic question of who is who is Jesus? Okay, and so Nicaea was uh, a council of bishops. Uh, it was actually convoked by Emperor Constantine. Constantine. Why? Well, because, you know, he, the bishops in the East, especially, were um, having a disagreement over the nature of who Jesus was, and they could not come to an agreement, and there was chaos and disarray in the, in the Christian community, and, and the bishops weren't solving it. They, they weren't making it better. So Constantine, in his role, as he saw it as, in a way, the head of the church, now that he was a Christian, decided, okay, I'm going to take control and I'll bring all the bishops together and I'll make them you all talk and you come to some sort of agreement. So that's Nicaea 1. What's the essential problem? I'm not going to go into great detail on any one of these, but just to let you know what's, what's going on, is that, you know, the question is, who is Jesus? Okay, that was a question even during the time of Jesus. Remember when I talked about, well, who was Jesus? You know, Jesus calls himself the son of man, but Jesus doesn't really, he's the Messiah, yes, but he doesn't, Jesus himself doesn't really leave any definition of who he is. So if you have to fall back on, you can't fall back on the scriptures again, because the New Testament writings about Jesus just record Jesus, and Jesus, again, doesn't define exactly who he is. So what do we have? We have the apostles' lived experience of Jesus. Okay, you know, how did, what was Jesus to them? What, what did he seem to be? Maybe he told them, I don't know. Nevertheless, the bishops have to come together to address this question because there's a controversy. I mean, the, the general sense or feeling amongst Christians um, was that Jesus was a God, okay? There was, there, that Jesus was in some way divine. Now that was the question because they were, they came out of Judaism, you know, monotheism, there's only one God. And certainly Christians believed that. But again, they, they treated Jesus, the tradition that had been handed down was that Jesus was somehow also God too. And, you know, look at the date, 325. I mean, it goes a long, long time with people 
you know, doing things as Christians, but maybe not really thinking things through until someone then raises the question, which someone finally did. Um, you know, you had some Christians who were saying, well, Jesus is not, Jesus is divine, but he's not fully divine. You know, he's kind of, he was created. He was sometime, you know, before the creation of the world, the one God made Jesus. You know, he made God the Son, who is a God, but a lesser God, a created God, a lower God. And it is that God that God the Father sent into the world in the flesh as Jesus. And that's the Jesus we worship. Well, that didn't sound right to some bishops. To some bishops, it sounded great. Like, yeah, that's exactly what I believe. And other bishops are like, nah, poop. No, no, that's not, exact, that's not what we believe at all. But the difficulty was people couldn't explain very well what they did believe. And that was the problem. So you had the Council of Nicaea. What did the Council of Nicaea do? And it's in the, you know, uh, in this first council, settled the fact that yes, Jesus was fully divine. He was fully as divine as God the Father. He was God the Son. He had the fullness of divinity. He was of one and the same divine nature or godness, you could say, or stuff, divine stuff as the Father. He wasn't a lower God. He wasn't a second God. Um, that's another question you have to kind of figure out. But you know, he he was of the, that that it was a very limited statement and a very limited vision of what they were trying to address. Okay, they just wanted to address this question of is Jesus some kind of lower God than God, lower God than God the Father? And the answer was no. He is fully God, was fully God, is fully God. But then there's this issue of the Holy Spirit, <laughs> you know, because Jesus. If you read the gospel, Jesus talks about a thing called the Holy Spirit. And some of this overlaps with Trinity. So I'll explain more when we get to the Trinity. But there's this thing apparently called the Holy Spirit. And so by 381, Constantinople, they have to call another council because there's some people who are like, okay, I get the fact that Jesus and God the Father are of the same divine nature. They're okay, fine. That Jesus is 100% God. I, I understand that. I accept that. We're, we agree on that. But what about this Holy Spirit thing? That doesn't seem to be a God. That's not God. You know, maybe the Holy Spirit's like a force or a power, but not God. And some bishops are like, yeah, I agree with that. And others are like, no, poop, no, <laughs> that's not right. And so we have further problems. And again, a Roman emperor, this time Theodosius I, my friend Theodosius, who remember made Catholicism, Catholic Christianity, the Christianity, the official Christianity of the time, the official religion of the Roman Empire. He has to intervene because, again, the bishops are not solving the issue, and he calls Constantinople the first. And what the upshot of that council is that they defend, the, the bishops come to an agreement that, yes, we do believe that the Holy Spirit is also God and co-equal with the Father and the Son. It's not a third God but is they share the, the exact same divine nature. So the Holy Spirit is with the Father and the Son, one God. And the immediate result, and I'll end on this because you know, it's too much, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to this with our next class, but um, the immediate result, or the, I guess the, the most obvious result, an important point of the Council of Constantinople is that here's where we get the fullest statement of Christian belief about God and who Jesus is that we have. And it's called the Nicene Creed. It actually comes from the Council of Nicaea. The Council of Nicaea, the bishops wrote up a very short, brief statement of belief, okay? But at Constantinople, they expand on it. They have to make some clarifications because, you know, like at Nicaea, it says, we believe in God, we believe in Jesus, and, and it, it defines the relationship. And at the end, it's just like, oh, yeah, we believe in the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> With no definition, no nothing, you know, um, no explanations. So it's unclear. So at Constantinople, the bishops feel like they need to express this more clearly. And so you get this, which Catholics and Eastern Orthodox and Eastern Catholics proclaim, profess every Sunday in their churches, this long statement, which actually comes from the Council of Constantinople, Hope you're listening because I can trick you on this in many various ways on a test. Comes from the Council of Constantinople, but ultimately is based on the statement of belief from Nicaea, which 
which is why it's called the Nicene Creed, the Council of Nicaea, the Creed of Nicaea. And you can see that threefold form. It starts with believing in God. It goes to believing in Jesus. I believe in Jesus. And then down here at the bottom, it gets to the Holy Spirit and they flesh that out somewhat. And it's probably I'll, best if I talk about that more when we get to the Trinity, but I just wanted to show it to you because it's there. This is where it comes from. Okay, um, I'll see you on Thursday. God bless you all. Hey, Miss. Yes, Ms. Dolter. Um, I didn't realize you don't, on Blackboard. You don't, I'm sorry, you don't mind if I, 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 I didn't realize on Blackboard I could go and look at my paper when you graded it. And by looking at that, I just did not understand the assignment. So that's what do you mean? I, I emailed you about going over my paper. Yeah. But then on Blackboard, I didn't realize I could go and look at what you highlighted. and. Oh, oh, yeah, I understand that. But what do you mean that you just misunderstood the assignment? You thought it was more like an opinion type thing or? Yeah. Okay. Because it was because, you know, I did lessons with the elders when I was younger. Um, you know, they thought I was going to be I was going to join and I actually was trying to convert them. But <laughs> so, so we were really kind of but they were really nice guys and I learned a lot. So, yeah, I was I just, you know, what I said, I hope I was clear, just it confused me because I'm like, the mass, and then, okay, so I was expecting something. Um, and then it's, as I'm reading, it's like, oh, I remember this from Latter-day Saint. And I, I say Mormonism, I hope you don't mind that. I know sometimes it can be said it's offensive. I don't mean it in an offensive way. It's just, but um, I'm like, this is what I remember from Mormonism. That's all like word of wisdom. Like, that's Mormonism. It's just talking about give, going up and giving your testimony during the, you know, like every time. So I was like, but then was she, you know, was she, and I looked at the discussion, but I'm like, yeah, you're non-denominational Christian, but the whole thing was like, this is where you're still going, which is fine, perfectly fine. I mean, I'm not judging you on that, I'm not judging you at all, but it was just, oh, it was like, you had a Catholic word, oh, you, yeah, and so it was like, uh. Um, I'm Roman Catholic, so I kind of, I don't know, I think I look at that okay. differently than other people. Yeah, I think so. Okay. Okay, so um, so Rome. Now you just said Roman Catholic, but you say non-denominational Christian. Is that what you mean by Roman Catholic? I I thought I I checked your discussion. Hold on a second. Let me check again because I just because when on the remember on the discussion.